I'm Jay Rosengard, and I am the, the chairman of the Harvard University Thai Studies Program Committee. I'm the director of the program, Professor Michael Hertzfeld, is on sabbatical this year. He's over um, in the anthropology department. Um, we have a fully endowed, um, that means in perpetuity, Thai Studies Program, and that means that we have an endowed professorship of Thai studies, and a search is now underway for that position. And we also have a lot of Thai um, program money for current events, ongoing workshops, seminars, speakers, which is managed by the Asia Center. So this event is, is co-sponsored by the Asia Center Thai Studies Program and the Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center for, uh, I think, appropriately democratic governance <laughs> and innovation. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Goon Prawit Rojana Brook, who is going to deliver our sixth Thailand at Harvard lecture. Um, Goon Prawit um, worked for 23 years at the Nation newspaper, one of the leading English language newspapers in Thailand. Um, before he resigned, I guess it's a year ago, September 2015, after he was summoned for the second time by the generals for attitude adjustment, which is an interesting term. Um, but he had an illustrious career there, 23 years, and he had a, a, a widely read column. He is now a columnist for Kausad English, um, and that is available online everywhere in the world, and we'll make sure you get the link. We'll widely disseminate it. Uh, just a little, little bit of background. Um, so Kun Chawit received a bachelor's degree in community development from the University of the Philippines and a degree in social anthropology from the University of Oxford. So he's been in old England, and now he is visiting New England. Um, pleased to have you. And he's received many, many awards. If you Google, you'll see a whole long list. I'll just mention two. Um, Reuters Fellow at the University of the Philippines and Chevening Scholar at Oxford. But there's a, a long list of, of global recognitions for his work. And, and Kun Prawit uh, is one of the bravest and most talented journalists working today in Thailand. Um, the journey to get here was not easy, but we're thrilled that you're able to join us today, and it's being um, taped. It will be widely disseminated for those of, of, of us in the Harvard community who had scheduling problems and, and could not make it. And the topic, um, we also thought very carefully, you know, how can this be a constructive dialogue on some very sensitive issues? So the topic, holding governments and journalists accountable, rights and responsibilities of a free press in Thailand. And so um, Kun Prawit will, will, will begin with some opening remarks, and we'll leave plenty of time for a dialogue for question and answer. But without eating into your time, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ajahn, um, Professor Rosengard. <laughs> um, it is a indeed a distinct honor um, to be giving the sixth Thailand at Harvard um, lecture today here. I would like to thank the um, Kennedy School at Harvard, Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovations, and also I would like to personally thank uh, Professor Jay Rosengard and uh, in absentee, um, Ajahn Michael Hartsfeld for this um, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Let me begin by saying that it would be a lie uh, for me to say that there exist um, true press freedoms in Thailand today. The coup on May the 22nd, um, 2014, led to an unprecedented level of censorship and self-censorship. 
which has not been witnessed over the past two decades, and I'm speaking out of my experience uh, over two decades working as a journalist that we have never seen anything as grave. In the weeks following the coup, soldiers marched to guard all major television stations. Some stations, like Voice Television, which is owned by a the son of Thaksin, ousted fugitive former Premier Thaksin Shinawat, was shut down for a month. Two years later, news director of the same station told me that the station has decided to reduce its critical political coverage by 50%, if not more. This is a classic case of the inherent structural problems of a corporate media because Voice TV's uh, news director told me that they have to defend the bottom line. And for those interested about the structural problems of the media and not just the Thai media, I suggest you uh, go and look at some of the works by um, um, Professor uh, McChesney of the University of Illinois, who is a professor of communications. I think he's a leading authority on uh, the inherent um, problems of corporate media. The print media, meanwhile, traditionally more vibrant and independent due to its accrued stature as a free, freer platform for opinion and debate, were more indirectly interfered. Editors of major newspapers would be invited every now and then to hear requests for cooperations by the junta a Thai-style smooth request for self-censorship on certain sensitive topics, if you will. Some lucky journalists who are persistent and bold enough in their criticism of the illegitimate regime were invited to have themselves detained inside military camps, and that's what they call attitude adjustment. George Orwell would have been proud of General Prayut Janosha, the junta leader, was for the past two years, who has for the past two years made himself the Prime Minister of Thailand. Uh, you might be aware he's actually right now in New York um, attending the UN General Assembly. So we're going to have two versions of what's happening in Thailand, one by Prayut and um, luckily uh, by me here at Harvard. After a week or so of being kept in Big Brother camp, opponents and staunch critics of the junta are asked to sign a memorandum of understanding that he or she would not join, assist, or lead an anti-junta movement and will have to seek the junta's permissions in order to travel abroad. Failing to do so means the junta reserves the right to try you in a military court with maximum penalty being two years in prison and have all your bank accounts and financial transactions frozen. Even luckier are the few who have been invited for the second attitude adjustment. Standard treatments include six hours of interrogations, wherein you are being asked about your parents, about your nickname, and why you are against the coup. Your smartphone signals are being, would be traced, and at the end of the interrogations, you were blindfolded before they put you in a nondescript van and driven away in the middle of the night for an hour and a half. When the blindfold was taken off, I found myself in a small four times four meter room, locked from the outside with all three solid wooden windows shut so I couldn't see the light of day or the vista or the sun. The ventilation was virtually non-existent and I had to beg the guards to let me out to breathe every two hours or so. And they did, but not after they blindfolded me so I wouldn't know where I was. No real human co conversations occurred for the first night and day although the junta left an old television set with two, with two blurry channels to watch. 
while they watch me through a CCTV installed from one end of the ceiling. My crime was to be persistent in criticizing and denouncing the, illegit the illegitimate military regime and my companion in solitary confinement, which lasted for two days and two nights, was fortitude. A day after I was released, which was last September, the newspaper I worked for for 23 years asked me to resign. I did resign and had since joined council at English.com and Persevere. And in May this year, the junta again banned me from traveling to Helsinki to attend UNESCO co-organized World Press Freedom Day conference. In case you're wondering why I'm here in, at Howard in Cambridge, the junta has since lifted the ban on uh, the travels ban on its critics um, in June this year. Um, free press advocates like Paris-based Reporters Without Borders or Reporters Sans Frontiers launched a Strident Effect operations to shame, to name and shame the Thai junta as widely as possible after I was prevented from traveling to Helsinki. But to be fair, Taksin and Jinglak had their own shares of aggressions against the press as well. And if may, I may recall some of them. State fund advertisements have always been used as rewards to friendly media organizations under Taksin, Jinglak, but also even now under the military government. Attempted corporate takeover of the Matishon newspaper groups through a proxy company during tax in time, scrutinizing the income and bank accounts of journalists who were staunchly critical of tax in took place. It happens against some of my seniors uh, at the nation back then. Alleged monthly payment, and th now this is under the Yingluck administration, made by some journalists on a monthly basis by an agent of the Pua Thai Party. And one of Taksin's most condescending, if not comical, act towards the press was to play a game wherein he hold a placard to publicly grade reporters' questions made to him at the government house, as if he was a schoolmaster and reporters his students. Back to 2016, it is no surprise that Reporters Without Borders will latest World Press Freedom Index rank Thailand at number 136. And mind you, a lower number is better. So it was 136 out of 180 nations. And you compare that to Kuwait at 103, Colombia 134, Ukraine 107, Zimbabwe 124, Afghanistan 120, and even in the Southeast Asian regions, Cambodia at 128 and Indonesia at 130. All were doing better than Thailand. To be fair, some Thai media disagree with such low marks designated um, to Thailand and believe that the Thai press deserves better. And to be fair, some of my colleagues have tried to scrutinize and criticize the military regime. Although majority of the Thai press made a grave mistake of treating the regimes like any other legitimate regime. And Prayut, like a normal and legitimate prime minister, while the fact remains that Prayut and his armed men in uniform, robbed the sovereign power of the people through the May 2014 coup. Some members of the press were more than willing to accept instructions on what should be censored and self-censored under the current regimes in order so that their business could survive. But not a few media organizations and journalists are, a f are firm believers in the military regime and voluntarily act as a staunch cheerleader 
and an apologist for the military regime. This is because they have lost faith in the electorate, or what we call electoral democracy in Thailand, and are cynical about politicians. And this leads us to the first context that I would like to address, which is Thailand as a society lacking in genuine social contract, which is deeply polarized. Any honest observers of Thailand would acknowledge that for at least the past decade, the society has been deeply polarized politically. And not, not just amongst, amongst ordinary citizens, but the press were deeply divided on what should be the desirable political course and system for Thailand. Some have given up on Western-style electoral democracy in which they regarded as ersatz. They have concluded that the majority of the voters or the electorates were simply too dumb and repeatedly false praise to what they see as self-aggrandizing and corrupt politicians like Thaksin and Yingluck, and were more than willing to support or at least accommodate one military regime after another. Now, does that sound familiar to the USA now <laughs> under, with Trump you know, and many um, Thais and foreigners being really bewildered about what's going on with his popularity? Under this context, where there exists stark disagreement the society needs, a, needs platforms for free and open debate and deliberations, not censorship or self-censorship or attitude adjustment. It would be grossly inadequate to merely focus and be obsessed about the issues of press freedom of, and freedom of expressions without thinking about this larger context of Thai society. Please allow me to elaborate. The lack of genuine social contracts and, the, and on the deep political polarizations in Thailand. Since the revolt which ended absolute monarchy in 1932, Thailand has had 19 constitutions or an average of one out of every four years or so. The latest one which passed a controversial referendum in August in a less free and fair manner due to the severe restrictions on debate and public campaign will become Thailand's 20th constitution. Permanent constitution in Thailand is an oxymoron. The kingdom also witnessed at least 12 successful, quote unquote, successful military coup since 1932, a testimony to Thailand's coup addictions as the king kingdom experience on an average of one successful coup every seven years. There are always coup supporters in Thailand. These people believe the military is cleaner than politicians and more altruistic, if not less corrupt. At least the lesser of the two evils, if you will. This suggests that a society deeply paralyzed without genuine consensus regarding its own political system and future. Given this context, the Thai media must try to act as a genuine forum or public sphere for peaceful debate and deliberations. Thailand's mass media are rather Bangkok-centric and represent views of the middle class and the elites with much less space for the working class and minorities and eth ethnic or political. Thais will have to try to learn to peacefully coexist with people who hold starkly different political opinions without suppressing others' voices. Thai society will have to try to learn to peacefully coexist with people who hold starkly different views on what constitutes a moral and acceptable political system without killing, hating, or censoring one another. The press can and should play part in facilitating 
rational and peaceful deliberations. By trying to serve as a forum and give space for various views, instead of trying to impose its own views onto the rest in a top-down manner. Nothing is being settled by shutting the ears and eyes of the public or those who disagree with you. It merely prolongs the conflicts and the polarizations of Thai society. With growing distrust on the media, more honest conversations have increasingly shifted onto social media. And um, for those wanting to dwell a little deeper on the distrust of the mainstream mass media, you may refer to one of the chapter in, uh, in uh, King Prashatipok's books called Legitima Legitimacy in Crisis, in, in which I co-wrote with a colleague. Um, I will not read it for the sake of brevity, but I will move on. Um, this truth is often complex, multifaceted, and contextual. Journalists, ordinary people often speak of it carelessly as if there's one and only truth, independent of factors, or independent of external factors. Good people to you may be bad people for others, depending on each person's moral and political compass. What is delicious depends upon one's taste but and familiarity. What is beautiful depends upon one's perspective, and etc. How are this beautiful, for example, with its red bricks, halls, and houses? But I think Oxford is magnificent with its dreaming spies. But that is simply because I happen to have studied at Oxford and not here. A hot weather is to be welcome after a cold winter, but not so in a country where the weather is always hot and hotter. Moving on to the second context, the challenge of the less majestic law and the future of the Thai monarchy. Where there exists self-censorship, journalists should at least remind the public of, of what is happening and not be part of the cover-up of such process. Let me give you two examples. On September the 12th this month, the stock market tumbled by 7% due to the uh, widespread rumor about His Majesty's health. And that is indicative of a society which doesn't really have transparency when it comes to discussing about the role of the monarchy. Those who violated the rest, less majest law face a maximum imprisonment term of 15 years. Exhibit B, a royal dog called Kun Tong Dang, who was on the news um, last year, late last year. Well, he actually passed away, but before he passed away, a man was prosecuted for allegedly criticizing the royal dog. And the Thai media pretend as if it didn't happen. I, ha I happen to have the uh, honor to be the only Thai uh, uh, mainstream um, reporter to, wrote, to have written about that. And the story was taken out from cows.english.com eight hours afterward unilaterally by the editor of the sister newspaper, which is Kaosot Thai, for fear that uh, the issue has become too sensitive. But this didn't stop foreign media from having a field day. And if I may just read part of what the economist, the London-based the economist wrote about it. And I quote, since the coup, the generals have made the use of laws against less majest or insulting the monarchy. Mr. Tanakon, that's the man who was prosecuted, has learned in a military court that the law protects the monarch's copper bitch too. The Bangkok factory worker has been charged over a sarcastic post on the internet concerning Tongdang. 
He has also been charged with sedition and insulting the king. He could be imprisoned for up to 37 years if, convic if convicted. All for Facebook comments, likes and shares. Rapes in Thailand earn 17 years less than that. Khao Sot English, the open-minded website that chose to break the story, that's the story I wrote, quickly took down the post. Other Thai media will not touch it. End of quotation. When it comes to comment regarding the monarchy institutions, Critical comment is just not possible. And to me, I think the Thai media should try to deconstruct this hegemonic discourse that there's only one way to perceive the monarchy institutions. And anyone who perceives the monarchy differently are uh, Thai. It is indeed a tragedy that Thai society cannot frankly and critically discuss about the monarchy institutions which is a very important institution, particularly now that the kingdom is heading towards a royal succession. What we see is higher number of prosecutions under the less majest law by the military regimes as well. Last context. The continued militarizations of Thai societies and the press. The press cannot be truly accountable to the public if it doesn't try to analyze and question the current militarizations of Thai society. Because a militarized society is an antithesis anti anti to a democratic and pluralistic society, we must try to hold the junta accountable, even though it's very difficult or almost impossible given the junta's absolute power. Just a few hours ago, I learned that the Thai uh, investigative news um, organization, ProPublica, which actually was found by a, a former uh, a Harvard uh, alumnus, uh, have resorted to use the Information Act um, to try to secure some information about the alleged corruptions linked to this um, Royal Statues Team Park in Hua Hin, okay, called the Rajapak Park. So there is an attempt. I don't know what will happen to Pro, Pro Publica or Kun Sarini. If Thai media is an organization, um, if Thai media as an, 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 an organization refuse to question the militarizations of Thai society and censorship, individual journalists who care about freedom and democracy should strive to do what they can on their own. A militarized views is an attitude wherein those who think differently are seen, are seen as a threat that must be contained if not suppressed or even eliminated, and not a source of social and political enrichment. It is about national security over human security. Militarized society is where voices of millions of citizens are less important than the whim of one army general. The arbitrary nature of an accountable and absolute power by the junta leader Prayut under Article 44 of the Provisional Charter is such that I dis that is, is such that I decided not to announce on social media that I would be coming here to speak at Harvard and to give this lecture until I got here, and actually I only posted this morning about what's happening for fear that Ajahn or Professor Rosengard might be under some pressure. The question is, in the long run, what would become of a society addicted, if not jaded, to the repeated use of unaccountable absolute power, which is known as an Article or Section 44? You know, in Thailand there have been calls Articles 44 have been used on several things, but uh, I discussed with Ajahn Rosengart um, just before, just while we were having lunch, that uh, it's probably useless 
in um, trying to prop up the economy or, and I told him flood is also something that um, Prayut couldn't solve with an Article 44, although he did suspend that the Bangkok governor a few weeks back. Now, the military way is a top-down command and it's about control and not horizontal or participatory decision-making process to which public could debate and deliberate. The military way sees those who disagree as disobeying, as a threat and a potential enemy, if not an enemy, instead of a source of diverse views that would enrich society. Without a genuine ability for the press and society to debate and deliberate, society can neither be democratic nor, nor free. It is what, in my views, the Thai press must be responsible for at present. In militarized society, obeying and not questioning an accountable and illegitimate order has become a norm. It's the opposite in democratic society where people can debate and deliberate freely about what is the best cause or answer for society. The military expects citizens to behave like soldiers, holding unquestioning loyalty to the, command, to the commander and obey his command without a second thought. This despite the fact that the junta leader, General Prayut, was never elected by the people and in fact robbed people of their electoral rights when he staged a coup. Absolute power is used in, um, continuously with no end on site and in su under such context, which will at least last for another 15 months, if you believe Bayut, and that's when probably the military regimes have promised that they will hold a general election. That the, pri that the Thai press must try to be responsible to the public and try to hold the military governments accountable, no matter how daunting, by defending the little press freedom we still have left and to continue to resist the militarizations of Thai society. Allow me to be fair to General Prayut by saying that he's not the worst of the Thai military dictators. Thailand have seen worst. Literary dictators like Field Marshal Sarit Tanarat back in the 1960s, which, which was, who, who was supported by the Americans during the Cold War, ordered political opponents to be executed and thrown journalists into, to rot in jail for years. But you'd also hold absolute and arbitrary powers like Sarit, however. And with it, people's expectations on what military dictators can and should do. This expectation has changed. We are no longer in Sarit's time. Thailand has moved on, and whether Prayut likes it or not, he has learned and is learning about it. The same can be said of the press, which has become accustomed to relative freedom, minus the less majest law, which forbid any critical report and analysis about the monarchy, that is. The Thai press has accrued sufficient social and political capital to act as a relatively free press over the past few decades. And totally, and in the end, they are unlikely to totally surrender to Prayut's dictums. And a number continue to scrutinize and criticize Prayut as we speak, as I speak. Absolute power is no longer absolute, for the world is increasingly borderless particularly when it comes to information flows and social media, increasingly bypass mainstream mass media self-censorship and state censorship. 
Journalists is a permanent critique, even ever inquisitive and skeptical and committed to unraveling the complexity of what is the truth. What is truth, freedom, and equality? Journalists must speak truth to power or risk becoming irrelevant. And that includes speaking truths not just to politicians, but the military as well. In societies under repressions like Thailand, the true calling of journalism is not just to report what's happening, but in playing a role in making society more free, reasonable, and equal. It falls upon committed journalists to not just call spade a spade when it comes to the limits of press freedom, but to also, but also to confront the innate structural constraints of the press in presenting the complexity of reality. I thank you for your time and hope your lunch, from your perspective, was at least tastier than my lecture. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very enlightened and moving presentation. Um, lots of food for thought to go with the food outside for our stomachs. So if anybody has any questions, we have two mics at the back and we would appreciate you using them because we're recording this, it will be posted, it will be disseminated. So even though we can hear you without the mics, it helps with the recording comments or questions for our distinguished speaker. While you're thinking, I will do the, do the first question, give you time to get to the microphone as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to be the devil's advocate a little bit here and it, use your imagination. You have to use a lot of imagination. Pretend I'm General Prayut, okay. <laughs> um, and you make a compelling case for the potential contributions of a free press to enriching Thai society, Thai dialogue. But what about the claim that a free press can further divide and further polarize an already very divided society? How do you respond to the, the fears of an irresponsible and polarizing press. Thank you for the kind and interesting questions. My answer would be that actually this is not the first time we had a military coup. Thailand is trapped in this cycles of coup. Back in 2006 when uh, there was the previous coup, very few Thais had expected that Thailand would return to the cycle of coup d'etat again. At the end of the day, we have to learn to grow up and become mature. And there may be price to be paid. And to be very honest, we have been paying a very small price compared to, say, the civil war here in the United States. And I'm not being bloodthirsty, but at the end of the day, people will have to learn to decide whether to believe in what the media say or not. And I may not have mentioned during the lecture, but I think part of it is a need for media literacy, where people should be able to learn to be critical of the media, of all political strike. That would be my answer. We just can't allow the one military regimes after another to nanny us like babies. Thank you. Yeah, I think your point about having um, an informed consumer of the information and civil society as a, a watchdog on the press is, is very well taken. Um, yes. Most of us know you, but please introduce yourself anyways. Oh, hi, um, my name is Kate um, Hatirat. I'm a student at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, thank you so much for traveling all the way to speak to us. I have a question. I think a week, only a week or two ago, the government ironically used 
the Article 44 to say they are not going to let civilians go to military court anymore? Um, do you think that would help the situation in any way? Thank you. Yes and no. Uh, in the short term, the answer is yes. There are currently, I believe, uh, 1,864 cases which have gone, to, you know, cases of civilians having to face the military court. And these people will not be, uh, will, will, will not be included under the new order. So it's not retroactive. So 1,800 uh, 64 people will continue to have to face the military court. Some have already been sentenced, actually. And I said yes in the short term because it would spare more civilians who would face security-related charge from having to go to the military court. However, as I have mentioned, in the long run, uh, Prayut used Article 44, okay, his absolute power again, which basically added... Article 44 gives him the power to override all the three um, branches, the judiciary, the executive, and the uh, legislative. So basically, he is the law. Now, in terms of the long-term prospect of that, and I have mentioned, the society is plunged deeper into this cycle of dependency on absolute power, which is unaccountable at all. This is a wrong way. When we solve a problem, we have to think about whether the way in solving the problem is legitimate or not. And in this case, he's not making things better because it's, that's another instance of, you know, another example of deepening Thailand's addictions to this absolute power, which is totally unaccountable, not to mention illegitimate. Other comments, questions, please. It's for the recording. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph. I'm a, I'm a graduate of the college and work in Cambridge. Um, so we first met just after the coup in 2014, and every time we talk, we're always talking about like a kind of uh, waiting game, like with the resistance. So the UDD or one of the parties or something else is in a waiting game. Um, when we talked in, last time we talked was June, we were saying there was a waiting game around the referendum. Now that that's passed, is it another waiting game or is it gonna transition? Or what do you think the current uh, sort of battlefield looks like with the resistance? <clears throat> Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I'll try to answer by not breaking the last majest law. Informally, everyone expect the military regimes to sort of oversee this transition of the throne. Basically, this is the sort of private conversations. When people wonder how long they would stay, it will partly, if not chiefly, depends on that factor. And as you know, His Majesty's health is not uh, in the best. Um, so that's probably the real um, waiting game. And as I said, this is really a tragedy. We live in a society where critical conversations in public about the institution is not allowed, you know, not allowed. How can we make sense of it without being able to publicly talk about it? And even sitting here at Howard, I am being constrained by the law. Unless you want to become an asylum seeker, then, in which some have done that. And to give you a, a, one example, Ajahn, um, this um, historian called Ajahn Somsak, GMT Raskun, who, is, who had fled Thammasat or Bangkok um, and has since lived in Paris, I don't think he'll ever get a chance to return to Thailand ever because of his overtly critical views of the monarchy institution. But at the same time, and as I have mentioned, that social media is bypassing the mainstream mass media. He has, I believe, something like 
200,000 plus followers on his Facebook. So while in Thailand, and while the Thai mainstream mass media censored itself, growing, a growing number of Thais are you know, accessing alternative views and informations through Facebook. We have to thank Harvard again, Zuckerberg. <laughs> Well, he studied here, they didn't graduate, but uh, I, I, I think social media is a game changer. And unlike China, I don't think the Thai military regimes feel confident enough to be able to just shut Facebook or Twitter down. We're not a big power. And I don't think foreign tourists coming to Thailand will be satisfied if they can't access you know, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. So this is the situation. Um, just another question. Um, under the new constitution that Thailand has just voted upon, do you see the freedom of the press the, in any way improve? I mean, assuming after the election under the new constitution, when will and so on, how, how do you see the freedom of the press after that? Thank you. The Junta sponsored draft charter, wherein Prayut uh, hand appointed each of the charter drafters, offered protections to the press, just like you know any previous constitutions. To me, that's not really the key issue. Okay, just to give you the example of Voice TV, wherein they decided to you know uh, cut the political coverage, critical political coverage by 50%. That's what the news director told me. And that's due to the pressure on the advertisers. You know, the advertisers feel that if this channel is just too politically radical, they will not risk um, paying for the commercials, for example. So even if there is that guarantee, the reality remains that the Thai uh, press will have to continue to try to defend press freedom by themselves, and that's really not just up to the law, but up to how bold they are willing to push the boundaries, okay? And as I have said, I'm not alone in criticizing the military regimes. If you read the Bangkok Post or the Nations or some of the Thai newspapers, Thai language newspapers, you will co see continued criticism. This is something we worked out and has become a tradition. Just like it's totally inconceivable that in the United States there would be a coup, you know, some general would just take up arms. That's out of the question. What we want to work is not a guarantee of press freedom under the law, which is already a done deal, right? Even the military regimes are talking about, you know, are willing to give that and talk about uh, being for 99.9% .9 democracy, whatever that means. Um, but a norm, we have to create this norm, which is independent of whichever constitution comes and go, and that's something that I have said we have succeeded to a level. They have learned to accommodate us to a level. We are not like Vietnam, wherein the press are totally owned by the state, and or in the Philippines, where journalists often ended up getting killed. So it's not just about the law. It's more about what you, as a journalist, are willing to do to defend press freedom um, given the challenges that we face. Kun Prawit, thank you for um, coming all the way over here to Cambridge and to Harvard. I wanted to ask you a question um, kind of about the uh, geography of the press in Thailand. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't know very much about the Khao Sot group mm -hmm. who publishes you. What is your audience like both in Thailand and abroad? And then the second, um, a, more broadly about the geography of the press, even if the military government steps aside, 
prior to the coup, Thai society was very divided, very polarized um, between the red shirts and the Democrat Party and the other side. Um, and how do you think the press will handle that? Briefly about Khao Sot. English, which is part of the Matishon group. Matishon is the leading broadsheet, uh, Thai language broadsheet in Thailand. And Khao Sot, the Thai papers is more tabloid like, but well, that's a Khao Sot Thai, all right? As for Khao Sot English, which is just an online, at least for the meantime, uh, news um, portal, we have our own separate team. Though we are part of the Matishon slash uh, Khao Sot uh, newspapers group. So this is a relatively young, it's been around for I believe two years or so. And I joined them after the nation um, asked me to resign. They uh, sent the editor to come and uh, offer me a job. So I thought, well, I'm so lazy, I didn't have to even fill up the form. So I mean, I'll just take it. Uh, so I joined. and. People, and we are very particular about pushing the boundaries. So as in the case of the news on Kun Tong Dang, you know, and the prosecutions of the man who has been accused of defaming the dog, thus defaming the king, I happen to be the only uh, person to, from the mainstream mass media and the first to break the news. And the news was, came out in English first, amazingly, on Khao Sot English, although it was pulled out eight hours after that, but by then, you know, people have um, saved it and it has spread. That's the nature of the cyberspace. Now, to your second question, um, if I remember it um, correctly, um, we must understand that although it looks as if the country or the kingdom is peaceful now, relatively peaceful now, but the political divisions it's still there. It's just beneath the surface. You know, it's an uh, there is a strong undercurrent. If you read Thai, so even in English, and do uh, and if you're active on Twitter or Facebook, you would continue to see examples or, or the uh, effect of this deep political divisions, trolls, hate speech. All this still exists on social media. So what we are witnessing under the military regime is actually something which is just temporary, you know. It's not really addressing the root cause of the problems. I don't see how it will ever address that. And that's going back to uh, Professor Rosengard. That's why I said I don't think this is the answer, you know. At the end of the day, uh, the coup and the military regimes only managed to suppress the deep polarizations of Thai politics, and it will continue. God forbid, we, we, we really hope that they have learned, you know, a few people have been killed uh, on both sides, you know, during various uh, large demonstrations, demonstrations which shut down parts of Bangkok by both the, the red shirts, the yellow and the PDRC. And my heart goes to all people who have been killed and, um, Unfortunately, sorry, unfortunately, I think very, very little progress have been made in bringing the perpetrators to justice. Okay, so what we are, I'm, I'm not expecting change, but I really hope people will really learn to at least coexist despite the differences without killing one another. And I think the media will have to try to convince uh, the public and they'll have to try harder. I think that's um, a cautiously hopeful note to end on. It reminds me of President Obama when he first took office and he said, we can disagree without being disagreeable and this is perhaps our hope for Thailand down the road. So please join me in thanking our very distinguished guests. Um, and we wish you all the best in the, in the struggle when you return to Thailand.